I'm Peter B. Collins. Welcome to my latest conversation here on Marin TV. My guest today is investigative journalist Peter Byrne. Welcome back to the program, Peter. Thanks for having me. You've published a blockbuster story, and the only problem with it is that it's an exclusive so far. So far. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to sit tight, because over the course of this half hour, Peter is going to help us understand the development of the Grayton Rancheria Casino in Rohnert Park, the involvement of former Senator Barbara Boxer's son, Doug, and his business partner, Darius Anderson. And I want to acknowledge that this is an ambitious undertaking. It's a complicated story with a lot of detail, and it is largely based on an arbitration that occurred, which Darius Anderson and Doug Boxer came out of as the losers. And uh, we will detail this for you. Uh, you'll also see parts of the article on the screen. I encourage you to either pick up the Bohemian or we will post a link on the screen for you to go to the Bohemian's website where you can read the article uh, in its full glory. So Peter, first of all, what tipped you off <coughs> and got you interested in this story of Sonoma County's first big Native American casino and the origins of this, which take us back to 2002. Well, as you know, I, I do a lot of investigative reporting and science writing, and um, I, I do national stories and international stories, but I love local reporting. So for years, I've kept a, a foot into the um, alt-weekly world, uh, including the Bohemian here in, in um, Sonoma County and Marin and Napa. And which, let me just point you know, out, you were last here on your major series that was published by the Point La Raised Light. By the Point Raised Light. About right. the false claims of a breast cancer cluster here in Marin County. Yeah, so, you know, the stories I do tend to be, and it got an award. It got the top science writing award of the year from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, by the way. Congratulations. I got a free trip to Boston and a $5,000 check. Nice. So, um, you know, I, I find that the, the little papers, like the Point Reyes Light and the Bohemian and, and others, uh, tend to be able to do stories now that the mainstream media completely ignores because it's so corporatized and, and chasing clicks and, and, and the latest tweet by, you know, psychopaths that um, they, they turn into some kind of quasi-meaningful um, meme. So um, being a, a, a locally oriented reporter, I'd been following the development of the casino in Rona Park um, for years. Um, and I learned in 2014 that there had, was a court filing where the tribe, the Federated Indians of the Great and Rancheria, sued Darius Anderson's firm uh, Kenwood Investments, uh, number two, uh, uh, which included Doug Boxer and some other characters, um, for basically um, uh, what ended up being disclosed as a, a defrauding of the tribe by these two characters, who are two of the most powerful political consultants in California. In fact, and, and Anderson... And let's, let's, let's define that. Darius Anderson runs an operation called Platinum Advisors. And he has been a, an inside player in Sacramento for 15 to 20 years. He is a registered lobbyist. He has raised millions of dollars for Democratic candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that money uh, benefited Senator Barbara Boxer when she mm -hmm. was active in the U.S. Senate. She retired in 2016. Oh, he's a big money raiser for everybody. Gavin Newsom, Kamala Harris, Willie Brown, Jerry Brown. In fact, Jerry Brown recently appointed him to the board of the California Community Colleges system, which we may talk about later since it disperses $9 billion a year and there's some you know, investigative material there. But as far as finding out about this, I'd had my eyes on it and every once in a while I would check the uh, Superior Court docket. And then in August I saw that there had been an arbitration that was filed and signed off by the Superior Court judge. So I grabbed it, and this amazing story unveiled itself. I, I couldn't write about it for a couple months because I had other stuff on the burner. But in um, uh, early October, October 10th, uh, was, we were finally able to publish uh, this amazing story 
which really, in a reasonable world, would have become instant headline news, at least in California, if not beyond, because Mr. Anderson is a powerful figure outside of California. In However, it, it, the most likely place this story would find a home is the Press Democrat in Santa Rosa, which is owned by a consortium that's led by Darius Anderson. Well, yeah, so the thing is Mr. Anderson owns all the uh, news media in Sonoma County except for the North Bay Bohemian. Uh, the Press Democrat's a, a large, na nationally known newspaper. He owns the... He bought it um, from the New York Times. He bought it uh, from uh, a company that bought it from the New York ah, Times. okay. There was an interim. And, uh -huh. he, and he owns the Sonoma um, Index Tribune in the city of Sonoma, the Petaluma Argus Courier, uh, Sonoma Magazine and North Bay Business Journal. Um, so basically it controls much of the media in, in the North Bay as well as being a political consultant and a huge real estate investor. For the last 20 years he's leveraged pu public funds to redevelop Treasure Island which is probably the most valuable piece of real estate on the planet in the middle of San Francisco Bay into a luxury condominium yacht haven and it's been kind of scandal ribbon but it's ongoing. So at any rate, um, the Press Democrat did do a story on it eventually. Once I think they got wind that uh, I was working on it, they wrote a little 900-word piece that uh, portrayed what happened as uh, an unfortunate occurrence where Mr. Anderson was trying to help the Indians, and they had a disagreement, and that was the end of that. They didn't mm -hmm. ever mention the F word, which in this case is fraud, which we can use with impunity because three retired Superior Court judges and a sitting Superior Court judge have certified the use of the word fraud to describe what Mr. Anderson and Mr. Boxer did to the uh, Grayton Indians. Now, this goes back to uh, the late 90s, when legislation became fairly common for tribes that did not have a property or a reservation, and the laws enabled them to basically create a new tribal, uh, uh, it ne doesn't necessarily have the term reservation, but a tribal home based on a piece of property. And we've seen across the country how that has been used to create gaming uh, uh, sites, casinos. I call it gambling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and this has become a, a revenue center for tribes, many of which were impoverished. But also we've seen a whole lot of um, uh, opportunism on the part of uh, business people who sidled up to the tribes and the generally Nevada-based uh, casino operators who are often contracted to actually run uh, these casinos for a tribe. Exactly. So Senator Boxer uh, put in, uh, inserted into a bill language that enabled the Grayton tribe to essentially buy land and create a new uh, homeland for, or a new sovereign home for well, she the tribe. She, she restored, she wrote legislation that restored the sovereignty because their sovereignty had been taken away by the government years before. In the 50s, the 1950s? Uh, it's been in and out over the years, but it's a, a, a terrible story that actually Greg Saris, who's the chairperson of the tribe, <laughs> wrote a wonderful novel called Watermelon Nights, um, which is worth reading because it, it pretty much details uh, what happened to this tribe, which was based in, around the town of Sebastopol and, and Grayton. But Boxer wrote this legislation that restored their sovereignty, gave them the right to establish a business, uh, which you know everybody knows is going to be a casino because what are the choices? Run a senior home or a, a vegetable store or a liquor store or whatever, you know? Um, and not too long after the legislation was passed, Doug Boxer and uh, Mr. Anderson, who worked together at Platinum Advisors, uh, his lobbyists, came calling on Mr. Saris, who's now a um, professor of creative writing and Native American studies at Sonoma State. He was at UCLA at the time. And he uh, had, with the tribe, uh, agitated for years to restore their sovereignty and did a pretty remarkable job and um, generated a lot of local heat and opposition from people uh, ranging, ranging from, you know, just outright racist responses to, um, you know, NIMBY kind of stuff. Um, at any rate, the idea obviously was to build a casino and Boxer and Anderson came to Mr. Saris and then to the Tribal Council making all sorts of promises that they had political connections, that they could take them through all the hoops that you have to go through with environmental um, disclosures and uh, getting financing and contracting with a Las Vegas casino. I mean, it's immensely complex it is. political mm -hmm. financial task. So 
the tribe signed a contract with Mr. Anderson's Platinum Advisors to do exactly that. Unbeknownst to the tribe, and this is back in 2002, Mr. Anderson went and created a separate company called Kenwood Investments Number no. 2. Kenwood Investments Number no. 1 is the firm that is redeveloping Treasure Island, mm -hmm. and this is a multi-billion dollar deal. Mm -hmm. Kenwood Investments Number no. 2 was specifically to deal with the casino because what happened was that Mr. Anderson went and bought an option to buy 1,700 lands, uh, 1,700 acres of wetlands at the intersection of Highway 37 and um, uh, um, right by, the, by the bay. At Sears know. Point. At Sears Point. Right. So right. it it's, would have been just east of Sears Point. You're right. It's it protected... Uh, it's actually 50,000 acres of protected mm -hmm. uh, wetlands there. Yeah. And uh, he got an option to buy one of the remaining portions that hadn't been protected yet at that time and um, paid $100,000 for it. Uh, but didn't tell the tribe that, that he had bought it. Uh, and he, it was bought by his new firm, Kenwood Investments Number no. 2, in fact, which um, he and Mr. Boxer owned along with a San Francisco city official named Stuart uh, Sunshine, Sunshine. Yeah. And, who was an official in San Francisco at the time, worked for the airport, I believe, and Jay Wallace, who uh, also works with uh, Mr. Anderson and Platinum Advisors. And they um, went to the tribe and said, well, we think you should build your casino on this nice site down at the intersection of Highway 37, you know, at the, in the wetlands. And... Um, uh, they didn't disclose to them that they had bought an option on it at the, at the time. Uh, so what happened was that at the same time they were doing that, Anderson went to uh, four Las Vegas corporations, uh, Harrah's and MGM and, and, and uh, such like, uh, and submitted re what is called a request for proposals, which is an invitation for these corporations to bid on managing the Great and Tribe's future casino enterprise. Because... You know, this is a massive enterprise. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars to build a casino. Uh, the tribe had nothing, uh, so they needed in investors and they needed expertise, and this is only logical. And, and let me just clarify that you report that the uh, use of Kenwood Number no. 2 <clears throat> was not disclosed to the tribe for uh, several months between the fall of O2 and the spring of O3. Right. And that uh, the terms of the request for proposal, the RFP, were heavily favoring Kenwood and brought almost nothing to the tribe. Well, it was amazing. The RFP basically said you have to buy the land from uh, the option from Mr. Anderson, and then you have to give him $10 million, and then you have to give him 10% of the net revenue of the casino going forward. It was an amazing self-serving thing, and it didn't ask for anything for the tribe, really. Um, Harris made, uh, uh, responded to the proposal and said, well, actually, uh, we would like to give the tribe more than you asked for. We'd like to give them a $25 million quality of life loan. We'd like to give them a $100,000 scholarship program. We'd like to give them $4 million in pre-development costs. And it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. and it was a very attractive offer. And by the way, we would like to talk directly to the tribe, Mr. Anderson, because we need to know that you actually are representing them uh, since you told us that you were. Right. He had told them that he actually would be the one that would choose who would win the um, bid for proposals. Mr. Anderson said, I'm sorry, uh, you guys are out of the, the, the plate. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's, he scotched their, their proposal. And he didn't tell the tribe uh, that they had made a proposal. But the tribe didn't even know at that time that he had put out a request for proposals. He did, however, uh, make a deal with Station Casinos, which is another big firm, that um, was very favorable to him. They gave him large consulting fees that... Uh, Enable, uh, that it required that station give him $5 million for the, for the land uh, and, and on and on and on and uh, gave the tribe basically um, butt kiss. Um, and so he went before the tribe at this point and, and told them, well, um, we've put out uh, some, some feelers and station uh, wants to join with you and, and help you, you know. Um, and um, a, a, a shortly thereafter, the tribe realized that he had put out these requests for proposals without telling them, and they got a little mad. Um, but he never told them about Hera's offer, ever. Mm -hmm. And 
when it was announced publicly that the tribe was now intending to build this casino complex on the wetlands, all heck broke loose. All, all the environmentalists in the area Run got cable, up You can say hell. All, all, all heck, all hell <laughs> broke loose. You know, I can use the F word too, fraud. And um, <laughs> so uh, it, it, it was so political that, that Diane Feinstein, who has actually some interesting connections to station casinos through her husband's properties, uh, got, which you, you've written about, which the, I've written about, the of Feinstein course. Feinstein Blums, yes, yeah. <clears throat> but that's another story. Uh, she actually. Uh, got upset and threatened to uh, take away the tribe's sovereignty if they built on these wetlands. Uh, Greg Saris and the tribal council immediately backed up. They didn't realize that they had, come, uh, you know, were, were, were had suddenly become embroiled in such a, a hornet's nest uh, and said, oh, no, 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 we'll, we'll go find someplace else. Um, the, long, the short story is that they ended up having to uh, buy off uh, Anderson's um, uh, option to uh, and give him uh, to the tune of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, giving him a profit of you know six hundred percent. Then they had to buy the land for four million dollars and donate it to a, a conservation group, which has since restored it. Mm -hmm. Then they had to go and find some place to build their casino. So by this time, which is two thousand and three, uh, Mr. Anderson and Mr. Boxer were not really doing any more work for the tribe because the tribe had figured out what they were up to, and. As the arbitration uh, reveals, which we'll get to how that happened in a minute, the tribe was so f scared that Anderson would use his political connections to undo the extent that they had come that this far um, that they didn't go public with what had happened. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one, one of the other elements here at this same time period <clears throat> is that Anderson switched up the representation of the Grayton tribe. Initially, it was under his main firm, Platinum Advisors, right. which is a registered lobbying firm, and lobbying was part of the package that was offered to the tribe mm -hmm. uh, in, term, in exchange for the terms that Anderson was trying to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And then he shifted the agreement to Kenwood uh, number two right. with different terms, right. including... Uh, a, waving, a waiver of the sovereignty of the tribe when it came to any litigation. Right. They had a, a clause waiving the sovereign immunity of the tribe, and um, uh, it also gave Kenwood all sorts of extraordinary powers over the, the fate of the tribe. Um, and at the same time that the tribe was okaying the switch from Platinum Advisors to Kenwood, Mr. Anderson went behind their back and after saying he, that he would not do this, made a separate side deal with stations to be their consultant for you know hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, uh, and tried to keep the tribe in line, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which the judges in the arbitration later concluded was an act of outright fraud and a breach of their contract. Well, and, and what is amazing is that at each stage, as Anderson and Boxer were kind of brushed back by their poor judgment and the scam that they were trying to pull off, they kept going. And uh, even though there was virtually no uh, connection to the ultimate site of the casino in Rohnert Park, the acquisition of it, the building of it, the uh, you know government relations that were needed to grease the way to do it, uh, Anderson and Boxer had no involvement in that, yet uh, at the time of the grand opening of the casino in Rohnert Park, they presented a demand for $43 million. Yes. Ten years... Ouch! That's chutzpah. Ten years after they had parted ways with the tribe, on the day that the casino opened, Anderson wrote a letter saying, you owe me 40... You know, Kenwood number two, which is him, uh, in Boxer, $43 million because we're entitled to 2.5% of the net revenues of the casino for seven years, and that's what they calculated it to be. It was an extraordinary piece of hood spot, and you know he'd obviously been waiting all his time to do that. Um, the tribe was like taken aback, of course, and they immediately sued in superior court, saying that he didn't have the right to um, make them go into arbitration over this because it was an arbitration clause in the contract. And superior court said, well, actually, he does have the right to do that because you waived your sovereign immunity which in they the did. shift to the Kenwood number two agreement. Right. Mm -hmm. So. 
the court remanded the entire process to arbitration, and that's a very legalistic, it's very much like a trial itself. Mm -hmm. It takes place at, uh, uh, in this case, Jams in San Francisco. There was three retired Superior Court judges, all with impeccable reputations, as far as that goes, like William Cahill. And, and Peter, you know. let me point out, because I've had a little experience with arbitration and mediation, those venues don't typically declare a clear winner and a clear loser. They are typically looking for a settlement. Mm -hmm. They're looking to split the baby. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen no. in this arbitration. You hit the nail on the head. It was so extraordinary about this because Anderson complained that the tribe had ripped him off. And after a two-month trial with tens of thousands of pages of depositions and trial testimony and just thousands of, literally thousands of exhibits and emails and stuff, the judges wrote this amazing arbitration agreement that said that Mr. Anderson's Judge, claim... Judgment. A was, yeah, you said agreement. It was an arbitration. Uh, yeah, a judgment. judgment yeah. uh, they said that Mr. Anderson's claim was without merit, uh, that he actually had to pay the tribe's legal fees for uh, involving them in, in, in this uh, dust-up, um, and that um, although justice had not been done and the tribe had allowed Mr. Anderson to defraud them back in the day, uh, the court was now adamant that, and the judges were adamant, that justice would now be done and that this would be made public because these types of agreements are normally under seal and they're not made public. And so uh, Anderson and, and Boxer and, and, and their partners obviously agreed that this would happen, but they rejected their names out of the arbitration award. However, it's obvious who they are, and uh, I have a, 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 the attorney for the, the tribe has, has verified to me who mm -hmm. they are, so that's no yeah, problem. I read the arbitration uh, decision, and it's remarkable. I, I mean, I've seen these CIA documents that are so heavily redacted, and Valerie Plame published her book where uh, all of the stuff that was excised by the agency was actually blacked out on the page. Uh, and that's right. what this reminded me of. I mean, why does Darius Anderson think that he should be incognito in this proceeding? I guess because he doesn't want to see in the press Darius Anderson defrauded the tribe. He'd much rather see Kenwood Number 2 defrauded the tribe because, mm. it, you know, he's a spin artist. This is, he makes his living spinning and, you know, making deals. Um, and, but also what was redacted was the names of all the politicians that were involved. That was part of the deal, like mm -hmm. Feinstein and, and whoever else. You know, there was numerous local people. Um, so in the end, um, we published this remarkable story uh, and I expected that, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle, maybe the Sacramento Bee, the Los Angeles Times would be all over it, but mm -hmm. they weren't. I actually reached out to people at all these newspapers and said, hey, have you seen this? You might want to write about it. No problem. You know, I'll give you whatever you need. Uh, but none of them would do it. I reached out to um, Dan Walters, the uh, Sacramento Bee columnist who's now at Cal Matters. Right. I said, Dan, have you seen this story? He goes, yeah, it's a great yarn. That's what he said. It's a great yarn. And I said, well, aren't you going to write about it? And I got all these emails with Dan, mm -hmm. right? And he goes, I don't write about things that other people have written about. And I'm like, oh, really? Well, this year, I mean, this week you wrote a story about how the schools are in trouble. Or, and you wrote a story about the, the Feinstein de Leon debate. So, like, uh, what's keeping you from doing this? Maybe it, is it that Southern California Edison is one of the main sponsors of Cal Matters and a whole bunch of other corporations who may or may not be represented by Mr. Anderson's platinum advisors? So, at any rate, uh, since... You know, in California, the, the media tends to be embedded with the, the various corporate interests. Uh, I'm not sanguine that, that any of them are going to pick up on this. So I and, decided... And you, you, you occasionally freelance for Fox News. Well, as, yeah, as back... A, you you, write stories. Before they became a, a mouthpiece <clears throat> for, for Trump, who I loathe and despise, uh, uh, I, I wrote some stuff for, on the Panama Papers for them a couple years ago and, and mm -hmm. on the Clintons because, you know, um, it was interesting and it was truthful and there were really great stories. So I thought, well, the right tool for the right job. They should hate, you know, the Democrats right now, so I'll take this story to them. And I did. My editor there was a great story. We'll do it. They gave me a contract. A few days went by. I said, where's the story? Because I wrote it, you know, I, I condensed it down to a thousand words. And it goes, oh, well, actually, we can't run it because Darius Anderson, um, it was it happened a long time ago, and, and he didn't uh, respond. Uh, he didn't make a comment when you asked him for a comment. And I'm like, 
Well, yeah, I'm not surprised that you didn't make a comment because what's he going to say is like, yeah, yeah, I did it and I'm really sorry, or no, I didn't do it, but there's a court judgment that says I did. There's nothing he can say. Well, and, he could say, you know, I like beer. He could say that, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever it is that he, he <clears throat> likes. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that um, he made a settlement uh, by agreeing that the arbitration award was uh, factual, and so he, there's no way he can deny anything mm -hmm. that has to do with it. And uh, Fox killed the story, you know, I've had other stories killed there um, because people made phone calls. So, you know, I don't know um, who Darius called or if he did, but it was certainly um, circumstantial. Yeah. Well, Peter, when I first read your story, <clears throat> it reminded me of uh, a sequence of events that I became aware of related to the uh, one-time super lobbyist in Washington, Jack Abramoff. And it's a complicated story, and I'll, I'll boil it down. But the state of Alabama was going to pass a, an initiative to start up a state lottery to support education. And Jack Abramoff represented the Choctaw tribes that have casinos in uh, neighboring Mississippi. So the Choctaws, who were misled by Jack Abramoff, in manners that are similar to the way Boxer and Anderson uh, buffaloed, pardon the expression, uh, the Grayton tribe, they uh, got the tribe to kick in $22 million. And they spent that money uh, in various ways to defeat the lottery in Alabama, and then went on, that operation continued, and they took out the Democratic governor, Don Siegelman, and the Siegelman case is a long saga. Carl Rove was involved, friends of the Bush administration, corrupt federal judges. Uh, but the bottom line is that Abramoff, with the help of Ralph Reed of the moral majority, uh, they used gaming money from Mississippi to uh, try to uh, manipulate voters in Alabama saying that, you know, lottery is gambling, gambling is evil. So they took gambling money to oppose gambling. Uh, and when Jack Abramoff got out of prison and wrote a book to try to recover his financial footing, I did an interview with him, and I ambushed him. I had on line two uh, a, a guy who had been the chair of the Choctaw Tribal Commission. And I introduced him to Abramoff, who got... You could tell, very uncomfortable right away. And the uh, Native American leader simply asked him for an apology for the way he had misled and abused the Choctaws. And Abramoff's response was just to hang up. Mm. He wouldn't even talk to the man. Mm -hmm. And so my point is this is not isolated, that Native Americans, as they were granted this renewed sovereignty, were then kind of led into the arms of casino operators, mm -hmm. many of whom have uh, committed fraud against these tribes. Well, the Cal yeah, the California. And just yeah. like this case, they are afraid to expose the people who they thought were the the guys with the juice who got them the arrangement in the first place. Yeah, irony is bound. I mean, it was the Las Vegas casino companies that bankrolled the constitutional amendment giving the tribes, you know, the right to uh, engage Las, uh, Las Vegas-style casino building, mm -hmm. you know, and it all went downhill from there. Um, and Peter, uh, we're going to run out of time, so I'm going to stop so okay. I don't have to interrupt you in the middle of a sentence. I encourage you to read the full article in the North Bay Bohemian, and I want to thank reporter Peter Byrne for joining us today to help us understand this complicated case. Oh, thanks.